Now it's time for the second panel. I think the first one was fascinating. I do wish we had more time, um, but they will be available afterwards, so if you want to ask more personal questions. And the only thing that I ask is after this panel, we're going to have question and answers also, but we really need people to use the microphones because C-SPAN is covering this, and then we have a student group that is taping this, and it's kind of difficult to pick up the sound of the questionnaires, even those who can project. So what we'll do is we'll have people actually holding the mic, so if you want to raise your hand, the person will come to you. Now I'd like to invite back up to the podium, Peter, or actually, he's going to run the second panel, Peter Clement. Thank you, Duke. Um, for our final panel, we're going to be focusing on the issue of, from the policymaker's perspective of the uses of intelligence and how it actually directs, hopefully, uh, the decision-making process or informs the decision-making process. Just on a personal note, um, I have to tell this story. In the current position that I'm in, I spend a lot of time looking at the Arab Spring. And one of the things that I have told so many of our newer analysts who are now working on the really hard, tough issues in the Middle East, I'm candidly saying, in my lifetime at the agency now for 33 years, this is the single biggest event for me, analytically, the challenges of the Arab Spring as the period of the declining years of the Soviet Union and the collapse. It's pretty big and seismic. And I can distinctly recall, in 1985, around March 10th or 11th, I took my very first trip to the Soviet Union, and I landed in Moscow the night that Chernyenko died. Of course, all my neighbors at home, they thought there was a connection between my arrival <laughs> and Chernyenko's death. I assured them that was not the case. I was very overt. I, I would not engage in such activity. But the reason I'm telling you this is the absolute sense of excitement as a young analyst at the time, because if you're a real criminologist, there's nothing more important than being at a funeral. The analysis that goes into analyzing who's speaking, who's carrying, leading the cortege, who's standing around, and the decisions that have to go into selecting the next general secretary. And as I think Doug McCacken said, we have just been through, this is a third death in about three years of a general secretary. And there was a great amount of anticipation about the future. We'd seen three rather old, unhealthy leaders selected. So the betting was, I wonder if this time they're going to pick somebody a little more junior who has a little more energy. And there were a fair number of us in the office who were betting it was going to be Gorbachev, despite rumors it might be someone named Grecian. It did turn out to be Gorbachev, and it was the beginning of an amazing period of turmoil and change and uh, analytic challenge for us in the office. And I still uh, get energized thinking about how exciting it, and a period that was to live through. So with that, I want to get to the matters at hand about the impact of intelligence, how, how it interacts with policy. We've got four uh, very distinguished and talented speakers here. Uh, I will just quickly go through the four speakers, and then I will go over to the first speaker, Mary Serrate. Uh, professor Serrate currently is an associate professor at uh, USC. Uh, sh she has recently published a wonderful book that got the Book of the Year Award from the Financial Times. I will let her promote it. But uh, it's a terrific book on the, uh, the events surrounding the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Uh, our second, sp and I'm not going to go through the entire Vita sheet on all our speakers in the interest of time, but if you go to pages 66, 68, and 69, you can read all the fine print about all the things that they've done. It's a very talented group. Greg Treverton, I've had the pleasure to work with in the past. He currently is the director of the Center for Risk and Security Analysis at the RAND Institute. He, in an earlier life, he's worked at the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He also worked as the vice chairman of the NIC, where he oversaw the production of national intelligence estimates, the very estimates uh, that many of the speakers spoke about in the last panel. I'm sure he'll have a lot to offer in that process and how that plays into the policy business. Our third speaker, Professor David Holloway, and I'm thrilled to meet him for the first time. He is the author of the classic work on the Soviet nuclear weapon project that led to their first bomb. It's called Stalin and the Bomb, not surprisingly as a professor at uh, Stanford, um, and he's a top-rate expert in the field. He's published widely on the issue of uh, international nuclear issues and the history of nuclear issues. Our last speaker, Annalise Anderson, is a, a distinguished fellow at the um, Hoover Institute. 
and she has recently published another widely read book, uh, which I have in front of me, called Reagan's Secret War, The Untold Story of His Fight to Save the World from Nuclear Disaster. She has authored or co-authored a variety of books listed, as you'll see, in the program. And I have a feeling she has a lot of first-hand insights into President Reagan to add as well. So if we could turn out to our first speaker, uh, Professor Zarate. Great. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I'm I feel very honored to be here and uh, to stand in front of the audience. And as the daughter of a veteran, I'd like to say thank you for serving to many of you in the audience. I know you've served in the intelligence uh, branch and also in the services. I thought, given that the hour is getting... You need the mic. That I cannot help you with, but the fine gentleman back there can help you. Am I now audible? Can you hear me now? No, and they cannot hear me now. Mary, you might want to try the... Can you stand at the podium? Uh, I could try standing at the podium. I am mic'd up. Can you hear me now? Shall I move it up? Well, that's working. All right, how about that? Better? All right, Better. take two. Hello. <laughs> I thought, given that it's a little bit late in the afternoon, I thought I would bring some images along with me to uh, help keep us all awake. I um, am just going to talk a little bit about one of the uh, findings from my book that intersects with the theme today, of course, the uses of intelligence. Uh, the uses, sorry, the uses of intelligence by um, Leaders? Okay. Ah, it worked. All right. Uh, tear down this wall, intelligence and contingency. Uh, the, um, one of the many challenges facing the intelligence community is, of course, predicting something a foreign government doesn't even know it's going to do. And the actual opening of the Berlin Wall is a classic example of this. The, um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about the transition from President Reagan to President Bush, since it was actually on the watch of George H.W. Bush that the wall finally opens, although, of course, President Reagan has a great impact on that sequence of events. Uh, and then I'm just going to show you about a four-minute video clip uh, of the opening of the wall and then just say a few words on contingency and intelligence. So uh, this, of course, is the map of Cold War Europe uh, during Reagan's presidency. You see here the border between East and West Germany. This is, of course, the map of my childhood and of the childhood of many of the people in the room. And Berlin was an island inside East Germany. So Berlin was further subdivided, as of course you know. It was encircled by the Berlin Wall, West Berlin, and that would cut off West Berlin from East Berlin. And of course, uh, President Reagan, President Reagan, <laughs> President Reagan. <laughs> President Reagan, of course, famously went to Berlin in June of 1987. And there's an image of him here. There's also images in the museum exhibit, which we toured earlier today. Uh, President Reagan, mm -hmm. President Reagan, there he is, standing in front of the uh, Berlin Wall. There's Chancellor Helmut Kohl. And this is an image of the speech at which he says, tear down this wall. But the actual opening took place two years later, November 9th, 1989, after Vice President-elect George H.W. Bush had assumed the presidency in January 1989. Uh, you see them here in uh, New York at the end of 1988. The events of 1989 were as unexpected as what's going on now uh, in the Arab Spring. Uh, and it was very difficult then to predict uh, what would happen. Of course, we know now that what happened in 1889, 1989 in Europe stayed peaceful. But I would ask you to just bear in mind, by comparison, the example of Tiananmen Square in June 1989, the same day that Poland had semi-free elections, uh, was the same day that the Chinese Communist Party decided to use the People's Liberation Army against the people to clear Tiananmen Square. So you see here the protests in June of 1989, the goddess of democracy staring down Mao in Tiananmen Square. By June 5th, the People's Liberation Army had uh, cleared the square. So uh, bear in mind that even though we know that the outcome of events in 1989 were peaceful, it was not apparent at the time, and so it was therefore very breathtaking when the East German government decided to respond to massive street protests. They, of course, uh, took their inspiration from the Solidarity Movement in Poland, which had been going on since 1981, but had become truly mammoth in East Germany. You see here, the, oops, let me go back. You see here this city, this remote doesn't quite work at this distance. You see here the city of Leipzig uh, in the evening of October 1989. There had started to be truly massive protests in East Germany. And it was a, 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 
it was looking like the East German government might follow the Chinese example. Indeed, the most recent piece of research I did was on contacts between the East German Politburo and the Chinese Politburo, where the East German Politburo was very interested to know how to carry out a Tiananmen Square. So there were great concerns that these kinds of protests, uh, such as the ones in Leipzig, in Dresden, and other places throughout the country, could end in similar violence. But of course, that didn't happen. We know that what did happen, what did happen, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we know that what did happen, of course, was the peaceful uh, over, overcoming of the Berlin Wall. And this is one of the great examples of contingency in history, because the East German government did not intend to open the Berlin Wall. The East German government uh, despised what Gorbachev was doing, despised the friendliness of his relations with Reagan and with the United States, and uh, found very sympathetic soulmates in Beijing, and it was trying very hard to seal its borders and maintain control over the country. And so massive popular protests, millions of people in the street, finally forced the East Berlin Politburo to do two things. It decided to start holding press conferences, which was a really bad idea because there's no incentive to develop media skills if you're on the East German Politburo. So the East German Politburo <laughs> decided to start holding press conferences, and it decided at a press conference to announce a relatively minor change in its restrictor travel laws. Uh, this has not been well understood, and even the voiceover on the video that I'm going to show you is not accurate. Basically, the East German government decided to make it easier to apply for a visa to leave the country. Uh, but you still had to have a passport, which was a whole other uh, bureaucratic endeavor. And then once you had a passport, you had to file an application, and then you would be told whether or not you could leave the country. But the sleep-deprived East German Politburo member who drew the short stick and had to announce this at the press conference didn't really understand this complicated change. And so I'm just going to show you a few minutes, of the technology God's willing, just going to show you a few minutes of uh, his press conference where he bumbles this announcement about visa regulations and then the immediate consequences as the flabbergasted border guards are suddenly confronted with tens of thousands of people demanding to cross the wall. All right. Uh, so we just have to advance it a little bit uh, to save Flights some of time. military planes. We're just going to advance it well, to some uh, to a few minutes to save some time. Also, you know, mir sitzt hier also mitgeteilt worden, dass eine solche Mitteilung heute schon äh, verbreitet worden ist. Nothing Sie müsste in Ihrem Besitz sein. Das tritt nach meiner Kenntnis ist das sofort unverzüglich. The news flashed around the city. East Berliners rushed to see if the checkpoints in the wall were really opening. The border guards were baffled. We didn't get any instructions from our superiors. None. Only observe the situation. We tried many times to speak to our superiors, but nobody got back to us. You have to bear in mind that our soldiers were fully armed on this day, as always, and they had one order. That order was to stop anyone trying to escape. But the crowds were huge now. Suddenly, the guards gave in. They opened the barriers. They opened the borders and didn't take any countermeasures. They didn't consult me or get my approval. Wunderschön. 
Altar. Auf einmal, I found myself in a group of people who were applauding. I didn't understand right away why. Then I realized I really was in West Berlin, and West Berliners had come to the border, and they were applauding us. We were all crying and embracing each other. Even now, when I look back, my heart is racing. It was so moving. Bekannte, die wollen mal besuchen, die warten uns zwölf Minuten. Wir wollen einfach mal ruhiger. Nur mal gucken, mal. Das ist traumhaft. Und dann wieder zurück. Wann? Ne, heute irgendwann. Oder, also besser es gesagt, ist doch heute. Wahnsinn! Wahnsinn! Das ist toll. Das ist toll. 28 Jahre, das ist die Stunde. Ich bin sehr glücklich. West-Berliners arrived from the other direction. They began to demolish the wall in front of the Brandenburg Gate. All right, so that was, of course, a clip from the... Uh... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wish I could take credit for it. I, I didn't work on that video series, although there are probably people here who did. That was from the uh, CNN Cold War video series. Uh, so I just wanted to show that brief clip uh, to show that this result, this is a picture of a unified Europe, roughly the European Union today. Uh, that was obviously the consequence of what happened that evening. And what happened that evening was not supposed to happen. So it's a terrific example of contingency in history, but it's also an example of one of the many challenges that intelligence collectors face. Because since the East German government itself had been trying to organize a crackdown, had been interested in Tiananmen Square, had been doing things like canceling the leaves for doctors, having extra blood reserves taken to hospitals. If you had access to that information, you would quite reasonably come to the conclusion that another Tiananmen Square was about to happen in East Germany. And the, the sort of miraculous event that a sleep-deprived, uh, incompetent East German Politburo member mumbles through an announcement at a press conference in a way that the reporters in the room think means the wall is open would be something that would be very, very difficult to predict. Uh, and so then, in that case, then, of course, uh, President George H.W. Bush, and you see him here with his Secretary of State, James Baker, they then had a very different challenge on their hands. They had a challenge of reaction to an, an unexpected event uh, and there, then, you can draw on the intelligence that you have, the long-term intelligence about the health of the economy and the state of the country and so forth. It was clear then in the intelligence materials that East Germany was going to collapse, and uh, the discussion of the Soviet economy also had fairly dire predictions as well. Uh, so there are times when intelligence is obviously very useful to policymakers, but there are times when it is OBE, overtaken by events. And this is one of the classic examples of that happening. And I've just been so fascinated by this that that's actually why I decided to write a book about it, which just came out in paperback. So, <laughs> um, so I think I've probably already exhausted my 15 minutes. But thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Greg Treverton. Thanks, Peter. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, with old colleagues and friends. I lived for 10 years in Simi Valley, so it's nice to be back here physically. And the library has been a wonderful addition, not only to the valley, but also to the nation. I had the opportunity a few months ago, got asked a good question by a magazine, by a British magazine, who said, what should we expect of our intelligence services? Not what should we, we should want, we'd like prescience and omniscience, but what, what should we reasonably expect? And that got me to reflecting on our subject for today, that is intelligence and the fall of the Soviet Union. Like Doug, I'm, uh, I don't think intelligence is meant to be primarily in the prediction business. We like to forecast, we like to assess. I used to, when I was at the NIC, take some comfort in the fact that uh, apparently, I hope this is true, it may be true enough even if it's not, that predictions of continuity beat any weather forecaster. So if it's sunny, you say it's going to be sunny till it rains. If it's raining, you say it's going to rain until it turns sunny. I used to think, well, they've got a lot of theory and a lot of data, and they still can't predict the weather. How can they expect us to predict something as complicated as the fall of the Soviet Union? Still, it's a fair question, I think. Uh, Ken's right. We didn't presume the Soviet Union was going to fall, but we had a policy pursued over a number of administrations called containment which said that if we kept some pressure on them, 
eventually the Soviet Union collapse of its own internal contradictions. So the question arises, could we have done better at understanding what was going on, if not predicting what was going to happen? I'd like to pursue that intelligence policy relationship uh, through uh, four points. One is one Ken raised already, puzzles and mysteries. He called them secrets and mysteries. Uh, second, questions that get asked and not asked. Third, stories. And then maybe if I have time, I'll say a word about capabilities. Puzzles, like Ken's secrets, are those things that have an answer, we just don't know it. And because the Soviet Union was secretive, we spent billions of dollars on intelligence systems to try and ferret out those puzzle answers. How many missiles does the Soviet Union have? How accurate are those SS-18s? It was impressive puzzle solving. Mysteries are different. Mysteries have no answer. They're contingent. They're iffy. They depend, they depend, may depend not least on what we do as a matter of policy. They typically, though, have some history and theory. So, for instance, what Russia's inflation rate is going to be this year is a mystery. Nobody knows the answer, not Medvedev or Putin. It's a mystery. It depends. But at least we have some sense for what it depends on because we know what creates inflation, how economies work. So we have some basis for knowing what to look for. The Soviet Union was a particularly hard mystery in thinking about its possible collapse. Uh, lots of factors bore on it. We knew some of them. We knew that the economy mattered a lot. Uh, I'll come back in a minute to stories. But we, uh, as our social science friends would say, the small sample size of those empires that have fallen, and therefore we couldn't get much guidance about the Soviet Union from other places. Next questions. Questions that aren't asked aren't likely to be answered by intelligence. My most vivid examples, I was uh, uh, in a White House that wasn't the Reagan White House in the 1970s, uh, and uh, Murray Feshbach, famous demographer who many of you may know, demographer of the Soviet Union, came back and Murray had all these statistics. This is mid-1970s. He had all these statistics that shouldn't have been right. Things were going in a direction for the Soviet Union that rich countries shouldn't go. Life expectancy for males was going down, not up. And there were all sorts of other, in retrospect, pretty clear warning signs of a sick society. At the same time, the emigres were coming out and they were telling stories about how toasters were more likely to explode than to toast toast, uh, all the shoddiness in, in Russian Soviet consumer goods. But we weren't asking that question. We weren't asking the question, could this be the sign of a deeply sick society, early warning? of a society that's really quite, quite sick. We were really focused on their military potential. Soon came the invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, we weren't asking that question. And not asking the question, we didn't get much of an answer. Imagine uh, if uh, an analyst had approached uh, Mr. Reagan early in his term and said, Mr. Reagan, I don't think you really have to worry about the Soviet Union much. You shouldn't be worried about the invasion of Afghanistan and military power or expansionism in the third world. What you ought to be worried about is the prospect that this place will collapse maybe within a dozen years. My guess is uh, Mr. Reagan would have been kindly and gentle, as he always was, but that analyst probably would find himself or herself counting submarines in the Aleutians as the next, uh, as the next job. Question asking is, is very much uh, related to stories. I've come through my years as a consumer and sometime practitioner of intelligence thinking that intelligence is really about telling stories and adjusting stories. If you don't have a story, then it, new information is just a factoid. It may bounce off. Now, when the story gets too fixed, we call that a mindset, and it often means that information bounces off again and often leads to what we call intelligence failures. But we didn't have a story for understanding those feshback demographics or the exploding toasters. Instead, we had a story that said, well, we know that Soviet defense industry is a thing apart. No, no surprise that domestic industry is bad, but defense industry is separate. And as several other people said, we had a story that said, when push comes to sub, the Soviets can just make their people suffer a little more and keep up do spend more on military measures and expansion. 
the closest I've found to somebody who predicted the fall of the Soviet Union was a, was a uh, British, conservative British columnist, Bernard Levin, in 1977. Uh, and he got the story right. He got the story right, it seems to me, mostly for the wrong reasons. His reasons were sort of stereotyping about cultures and ideology. But he said he got the main part of the story right. He said, the Soviet Union, when it falls, isn't going to fall from the bottom. It's going to fall from the top. It's going to be taken apart by loyal apparatchiks who uh, have a diagnosis of the system. Now, he thought that, I think, largely for cultural reasons. He thought the Soviet Russians are so passive, they wouldn't, couldn't be bothered to stir themselves to revolt on their own. It'll take somebody from the top. Uh, he thought the motivation would be a lust for freedom. In fact, it was Gorbachev finally understanding just how bad the Soviet economy was. But at least he had a story. Uh, he then said, well, when's this going to happen? Well, we can't know when it's going to happen. He said, but for fun, let's pick the 200th anniversary of the French Revolution. So he said, 1989. Not too bad in 1977. <laughs> uh, as my, uh, many of my predecessors have said, I have looked at the analysis of the Soviet Union in, the, uh, in this period, and two things about it strike me. One is uh, I agree with the assessment that on the whole it was uh, not bad. It was pretty good. Uh, somebody else quoted things. This is a 1981 assessment of the Soviet economy. It said the Soviet problem continues to be that of a, a less developed country with remarkably little progress toward a more matter, modern pattern. Even in those days, we were referring to the Soviet Union as upper Volta with nuclear weapons. Uh, the problem was we mostly focused on the nuclear weapons part, not the upper Volta part. And we found it difficult, second thing that strikes me about the analysis, we found it difficult to put the economic and the social political halves together. As Doug said that got better once they focused on it more explicitly in the CIA, but it's, it's a hard task. I think we don't do it well anywhere, and it was a particularly hard task in the Soviet Union. To come back to story one final time, this is the irony of the story. Uh, I think when Ken was talking about not being able to understand the uh, Gorbachev's economic plans, he was exactly right. Uh, Doug was right, they needed to be studied and looked at, but they absolutely made no sense. They were mostly pain for no gain. And once uh, analysts saw that and saw the story, several of them, senior people, like Bob Gates, uh, like one of Bob's successors, Bill Odom, the director of NSA, when they looked at it, they said, this can't be right. Gorbachev, what Gorbachev is doing is going to lead to the end of the Soviet Union. Odom wrote that in 1987. So they said, well, they, they, he must be lying. He can't. They had the story, but they couldn't believe the story could be right. Indeed, uh, the story didn't have to be right. Uh, but for Gorbachev, that sort of magnificent bumbler who had a good diagnosis of the system and absolutely no idea what to do about it, uh, the Soviet Union might have bumbled along for a few more years. It still might be bumbling along today. So very hard to make a prediction, particularly when one that's dependent ultimately on the actions and ineptitudes of one particular Soviet leader. Just a word about um, capabilities. As I said, the challenge of putting economic, social, foreign policy, politics together is a real challenge. And I worry that today in the intelligence community, we've lost a lot of that capacity to do what I think of as strategic analysis, that is analysis that puts a particular issue in a wider context, both of other issues and perhaps of time. We've been through a very tactical period, including the CIA. They've been through a very tactical period, fighting wars, supporting war fighters. Those are mostly puzzle-solving exercises, not mystery-framing exercises. I had the opportunity to walk around the various agencies a few years ago and ask about the state of analysis in the various intelligence agencies. And I heard over and over again, you know, we used to do analysis, now we mostly do reporting. Question answering, there's so many more issues out there, so many more consumers, but in this shapeless world, it seems to me the challenge of doing more strategic analysis that puts the pieces together in helpful ways is more and more important. Let me conclude with my own uh, favorite story about the end of the Soviet Union, which is also a good story for the CIA. Uh, soon after the end, I was in Moscow with a, a Benz, the Business Executive for National Security delegation. 
Uh, it was by far the most fun I've ever had in Moscow. I'd been a lot as an official, but particularly if you don't speak Russian, the, as an official in the old days, the line between hospitality and imprisonment was a pretty blurry one. Uh, and it was wonderful to be there when everything was open. You could, uh, 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 the, the coin of the realm was uh, Marlboro's, a pack of cigarettes would get you in trouble, out of trouble, across town. It was really wonderful. But my favorite moment, I never expect to have this happen again, didn't expect to have it happen then. We were in a gathering and uh, uh, a Soviet official, almost surely an intelligence guy I'd known, uh, came over. He said he hadn't been out of the Soviet Union in 20 years. Uh, spoke impeccable American English. For all they did wrong, the Soviets did do language awfully well. Um, and, he, so he, and he said, um, Bill Colby, a friend, former director of Central Intelligence, was on the delegation and this Soviet said, will, will you introduce me to Mr. Colby? I said, of course. So I took him uh, over and introduced him to Bill and he turned to uh, Bill and said, Mr. Colby, I wanna thank you for being part of the pressure that led to change in the Soviet Union. Not gonna happen again, but nice to have it happen once. David Holloway. Uh, I feel very um, uh, honored to be here. Uh, I didn't work in the Reagan administration. I've never worked in or for an intelligence agency, and moreover, I come from Stanford and have been at Stanford long enough to remember when this library might have been sited at Stanford and not here in Simi Valley. So it's with a sense of <laughs> deep regret uh, I have to uh, make that point. I'm going to talk about a very uh, specific issue that arises in the documents in the collection that we have been given. And it has to do with uh, an incident sometimes known as the war scare in Moscow in November 1983. And to do with the impact of the report of this scare on President Reagan's attitude to uh, the Soviet Union and the kind of policy that he wanted to pursue uh, uh, towards uh, Moscow. And so there are really two questions here. And the first is, was there really, as many people believe, uh, a war scare in Moscow in the sense that the Soviet leaders believed that uh, a nuclear attack by the United States and, uh, and NATO was possible in the short term? Um, and the second question then is, what uh, impact did r reporting on this have on um, the Reagan administrations, in particular the president's approach to, to uh, the Soviet Union. Now the first question, was there a war scare or not, is highly controversial. Uh, and actually in the collection we have, there are documents that give different answers to the question. Um, and the issue is basically this, as some of you, many of you will recall, 1983 was a year of great tension. I won't go between the United States and the Soviet Union. I won't go into the background or the causes. Um, but um, Andropov, who was general secretary of the party at the time, made a comment in um, September of 1983 that if anyone ever had any illusions about the possibility of an evolution for the better in the policy of the present American administration, those illusions are completely dispelled now. On, in the early part of November, between the 2nd and the 11th, NATO conducted uh, an annual command post exercise named Able Archer, which was to practice procedures for releasing nuclear weapons in the event uh, of a war. Soviet intelligence monitored this very closely, as it would be its practice, and on November the 8th or the 9th, in the middle of the exercise, uh, KGB residences abroad received an urgent telegram mistakenly reporting an alert at US bases and implying that the alert might mark the beginning of a countdown to nuclear war. Uh, according to one report, Marshal Agarkov, the chief of the general staff, went to his wartime bunker on the first day of the exercise and ordered some Soviet missile forces onto a higher state of alert. And other military 
measures were taken to enhance the readiness of Soviet and Warsaw Pact uh, air forces in, in Central Europe. Now, uh, Oleg uh, Gordievsky, a KGB agent in London who had been turned by the British, so he was acting as a double agent, um, in, on the 5th of November, inform, informed his case officer at MI6, at the Secret Intelligence Service, um, that a telegram had come to London from Moscow Center warning that um, once the preliminary decision had been taken uh, to go ahead with a first strike, nuclear missiles were likely to be launched within a week or 10 days. And the KGB was to watch out for signs of preparation of such an attack. Um, this information was passed to Mrs. Thatcher and Geoffrey Howe, who was then Foreign Secretary, uh, writes in his memoirs that the Gordievsky message uh, left us in no doubt of the extraordinary but genuine Russian fear of real-life nuclear strike. Now, in the collection of documents we've been given, there are uh, two. One, a memorandum of the 30th of December prepared by the um, intelligence directorate of the CIA entitled Soviet Thinking on the Possibility of Armed Confrontation with the uh, United States. And the memorandum concludes, Moscow does not appear to anticipate a near-term military confrontation with the US. It said that most Soviet leaders were, were very worried about the long-term trends in American policy, SDI, the deployment of intermediate range nuclear forces in Europe, the development of the um, Trident II uh, missile, Trident submarines, so that they were afraid of how things might turn out in five or 10 years, but not afraid about what might happen in a matter of weeks. And this memorandum seems very clearly to be a response to the question, did the Soviet leaders or do the Soviet leaders anticipate a near-term military confrontation with the US? But we don't have the documents that pose the question. We have the memorandum that answers the question by saying, no, the Soviet leaders don't uh, expect an attack. But that memorandum didn't settle things. There was a special national intelligence estimate done five months later uh, on implications of recent Soviet military political activities. But this reached the same conclusion. I quote, we strongly believe that Soviet leaders do not perceive a genuine danger of imminent conflict or confrontation with the United States. Now, in this context, however, it's quite interesting to note that uh, Bob Gates, in his memoirs, and he, I think, was deputy director of uh, intelligence for intelligence at the time, is much more equivocal uh, about uh, Soviet thinking, because actually in the same paragraph he writes, one, there is a good chance with all of the other events in 1983 that the Soviet leaders really felt a NATO attack was at least possible and that they took a number of measures to enhance their military readiness short of mobilization. And then later in the paragraph he says, well, the Soviet leaders may not have believed a NATO attack was imminent, but they did seem to believe the situation was, was dangerous. And in a study in the collection on the DVD that the CIA was done for the CIA, uh, I think in the late 1990s by Ben Fisher, actually a very interesting study of the, the whole crisis, um, uh, Fisher comes to the conclusion that in the late 1983, the Soviet leaders, and in particular Yuri Andropov, uh, believed that Reagan might order a first strike against the Soviet Union. And in a commentary, uh, there's some commentary on a later study done by the President's Foreign Intelligence uh, Board, uh, advisory board in the late 1980s that criticized the earlier CIA estimates for being dangerously relaxed. In other words, dangerously relaxed about the dangers that really existed at the time. I find this all very puzzling. I, I actually don't think for quite other reasons that there was a war scare uh, in, in Moscow and certainly uh, people I've talked to, but maybe I've talked to the wrong people in Moscow, uh, have, have uh, assured me that that was the case. Deep anxiety about how the relationship was developing for all the reasons we've heard about today, 
uh, you know, lagging in technology, economic difficulties, and so on. Yet, what's interesting is that uh, the CIA evidence, or at least if we include the CIA study, is really quite equivocal on whether there was um, uh, a war scare. And this is important, I think, for two reasons. One is, if we actually think that in November 1983, when the Soviet Union had over 10,000 nuclear warheads on strategic missiles and thousands of nuclear warheads deployed in Central Europe, if the Soviet leaders thought in that context that nuclear deterrence wouldn't work, we have, uh, I think, uh, we have to rethink uh, what we understand by nuclear weapons because there was clear, there was no doubt at that time that they could retaliate in a devastating way if uh, the U.S. or NATO had attacked. But the second, uh, uh, so in some sense, that would cast doubt on, on deterrence if the real worry was long-term trends that the U.S. might escape from the relationship of mutual deterrence with the Soviet Union, then that's a more understandable uh, anxiety in terms of the way we've thought about deterrence and, and the strategic relationship. The final point I want to make is that um, in uh, Reagan's diary for the 18th of November, that is just a little time after this exercise, this Able Archer NATO exercise, uh, he writes, this is for November the 18th, George Schultz and I had a talk mainly about setting up a little in-house group of experts on the Soviet Union to help us in setting up some channels. I feel the Soviets are so defensive-minded, so paranoid about being attacked, that without being in any way soft on them, we ought to tell them that no one here has any intention of doing anything like that. What the hell have they got that anyone would want? <laughs> this this is a, strikes me as kind of classic Reagan uh, prose. Now, some people have said, oh, he must have written this in response to being told about the alarm over the exercise uh, in Moscow about the war scare. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Tensions were very high. Uh, he may have, it, it could be just a response to the more general situation. I don't think it's, uh, and moreover, I don't think it's some conversion on the road to Damascus because already in, during 1983 he had been seeking ways to build channels to the Soviet leadership to discuss how to um, rec deal with difficulties and move forward to a better relationship. Um, but I think uh, what's very striking to my mind is that his response to uh, reports, however they came or whatever their substance was, about uh, fear and paranoia in Moscow was actually to sh seek to provide a reassurance as a basis for moving forward. And I think it's a critical turning point uh, in his policy towards the Soviet Union and of course ultimately uh, paid off in the greatest way uh, when he formed his relationship with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Thank you. Okay, we'll turn now to our final speaker, uh, Annalee Anderson. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and the Reagan Library have put together a fascinating collection of documents. Oh, okay, sorry. Anyway, I was just saying how fascinating this collection of documents is that have been put together by the CIA, where you can see what kinds of information Reagan and his administration were getting, and on the other hand, the national security documents, where you can see what he actually decided and how he used the intelligence, and also, also the national decision uh, directives that came out of this. Uh, the National Security Council documents show Reagan in action. Reagan chaired 355 of these meetings, plus probably another 20 that aren't recorded in the formal list of National Security Council meetings. And there were minutes taken of these, what everybody said, each you know, you can see the conflict between Schultz and Weinberger in these documents, and 
uh, a great many of them have been released and the, and the library is releasing more of them. Uh, my husband and first got access to them, Martin Anderson, and read them in the, in the uh, vault in this library and read through all 300 and all of the ones of 355 for which there were minutes. And so I wanted to talk about Reagan as uh, what we know about Reagan that we might not be able to learn from reading the CIA documents about the information he received. And here are the basic points. Uh, Reagan's views on the Soviet Union and his strategy for dealing with them are reflected very early in his own writings. And they were really rather well established when he took office, okay? Second, Reagan made all the decisions. This is pretty clear from reading the NSC documents, and it's the most striking conclusion that comes from reading through all of them. Uh, that, that, uh, and from reading his personal diary, which also has only been available since 2007. Third, I, I think, and I'm probably disagreeing a little bit here with other members of, not everybody, but with some speakers, is that Reagan's decisions and the actions that his administration took uh, had a profound effect on what the Soviets did. And so this was not all baked in the cake. It wasn't that the Soviet Union was going to collapse in any case, uh, that the policies of the Reagan administration really had an influence. Um, here is, I, in terms of Reagan's strategy, I want to quote something from a document that he wrote, an uh, insert for a speech in 1963. Okay, now we're, we're talking even before he gave the speech supporting Goldwater. And it sums up his strategy and goals. He says, the only sure way to avoid war is to surrender without fighting. The other way is based on the belief, supported so far by all the evidence, that in an all-out race, our system is stronger. And eventually, the enemy gives up the race as a hopeless cause. Then a noble nation, believing in peace, extends the hand of friendship and says there is room in the world for both of us. Now just think of it, that's 1963. And basically, that describes what he accomplished. Okay, that's it. Uh, he did, between the time he was governor, uh, when he left the governorship in 1975 until he ran for president in 1980, he did 1,024 radio commentaries. Each one of them is like an op-ed, three minutes. And he uh, wrote 686 of them himself. They are here in the Reagan Library as part of his uh, personal papers because they're written while he's not in office. And he says in one of them, communism is neither an economic nor a political system. It's a form of insanity. <laughs> a temporary aberration that will one day disappear from the earth because it's contradictory to human nature. And he had a great deal of confidence uh, in the United States uh, and its people. Uh, he said in his 1980 campaign, he basically said the same thing that he said in 1963. So it wasn't just a one-time thing. He said uh, he doesn't think the Soviets want war. He says, that he says the Soviets want peace and victory. They seek a superiority in nuclear strength that in the event of a confrontation would leave us with a choice of surrender or die. But if we have the will and the determination to build a deterrent capability, we can have real peace because we will never be faced with such an ultimatum. Indeed, the men in the Kremlin could in the face of such a determination decide that true arms limitation makes sense. And of course, Reagan told his pollster, Richard Worthlin, 
probably in 1983, that he wanted to be remembered as the president who took away the dreadful fear of nuclear holocaust that, hangs, that was hanging over the world that we woke up with every morning. Uh, he first started talking about going to zero nuclear weapons as an ultimate goal. He never proposed this in negotiations, but he talked about it as an ultimate goal beginning in 1982. Uh, as a decision maker, in his first NSC meeting, which is one of the documents that was, th that is in this uh, collection, he, he says um, to all his assembled advisors, who are members of the National Security Council, I will use the NSC structure to obtain your guidance, but I will make the decisions. He was very conscious of his prerogatives as a decision maker. And when he fired Alexander Haig, his first Secretary of State, and replaced him with George Shultz, he wrote in his diary, because Haig, Haig had given a little television speech about, about how he and Reagan disagreed over policy. And Reagan writes in his diary, actually, the only disagreement was over whether I made policy or the Secretary of State did. <laughs> so. He's, he's very, I call it, jealous of his decision-making authority. He tolerates extensive disagreement among his members of his administration. And he says, I went with Cap on this one. I'm going with George on this one. I think Bill Casey has this right. And so he disagrees. He recognizes that they disagree. And he wants to hear these different views. They come from different places. Uh, and there's a, there are huge differences. And he tolerates that, OK? He, he's obviously capable of firing people. And he keeps all of them in spite of their disagreements. Two of his decisions are especially important. One is, is the decision when he decides that he wants to follow the zero-zero path on intermediate nuclear weapons in Europe. And if the Soviets do not take their missiles out that are trained on cities in Western Europe, that he will put Pershing II missiles and cruise missiles into Western Europe to be aimed at Moscow and Kiev and other cities in the Soviet Union. And he's very determined about that. And he works very hard on that. There's a document in the CIA collection that shows that they provided information to help us work with allies on achieving this objective. But Reagan is absolutely determined on that. And in November of 83, we started introducing the Pershing and cruise missiles in, in Europe. and the agreement to remove them was not signed until Gorbachev agreed to the INF Treaty, and that, that was signed in December of 1987. Uh, the NSC minutes also show the many decisions that Reagan made about Soviet access to Western technology, sources of hard currency, and general economic uh, help that they could get from the West. And if you go back to the 1963 speech, again, this policy is foreshadowed there. He says, if we, he says this in 1963, if we truly believe that our way of life is best, aren't the Russians more likely to recognize that fact and modify their stand if we let their economy come unhinged? so that the contrast is apparent. Inhuman, though it may sound, shouldn't we throw the whole burden of feeding the, the satellites on their slave masters who are having trouble feeding themselves? Um, I, I find in the CIA documents a little bit of uh, conflict in whether or not, or, or uncertainty about whether or not the military is they're really increasing their military resources. Certainly, we knew they had a lot of troops. 
they were also clearly, the record shows, increasing their nuclear warheads at about 2,000 a year. And they, these, the number of nuclear weapons and warheads increased steadily, especially intercontinental ballistic missiles, but also sea-launched and bombers, missiles carried on bombers, uh, right through the end of 1986. So it continued a couple of years after Gorbachev went into office. At that time, the, the turning point when the Soviets had more nuclear warheads than the United States occurred in 1978 in the middle of the Carter administration. Uh, during Reagan, the number of U.S. nuclear warheads stayed virtually the same. Uh, so the number of Soviet warheads increased until they had 45,000 to our 23,000 or something like that. Once Reagan, once they went to Reykjavik and they agreed on many things that they want to wanted to accomplish in the START Treaty, as well as INF, even though Gorbachev, uh, even though Reagan refused to give in on SDI, they did negotiate on these things later. And the number of Soviet nuclear weapons starts to drop by one or two thousand a year, and the number of in in the United States drops dramatically, and so Reagan is the first president to actually persuade the Soviet Union to reduce their nuclear weapons, and there is really dramatic reduction down to about 12,000 for the Soviets and 5,000 for the United States by 2010 or so. And so by, uh, in 1988, when Gorbachev meets with Reagan the last time, and he goes to the UN, and uh, he announces a reduction in conventional forces, especially those in, use in Eastern Europe, and basically the Cold War is over at that point. Um, Reagan never crowed about winning the Cold War. He did not say the United States won the Cold War. What he says is uh, the Cold War is over and freedom won as we always knew it would. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, I want to thank the speakers for being duly diligent in getting us closer to on time for our uh, closing time. We have another 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. I'm assuming there probably are a few questions out there. If I could ask any questioners, if you would raise your hand so someone can get a mic to you so you can talk on the mic. I see one in the back here. Gentlemen. Uh, well, someone beat you to the punch. We'll get you next. Um, this question is for Mr. Clement, really, but uh, on the basis back in Reagan's time uh, when it was difficult to predict outcomes of events that dealt with large crowds like the Berlin Wall and Tiananmen Square and the difficulty in forecasting uh, outcomes of events that have been analyzed like the weather, uh, if we fast forward now to, like uh, Admiral Inman says, to the present day, should we or do we use computer modeling? to analyze outcomes and predict success. For instance, in a chess game, a computer can predict win, lose, or draw after a few moves, or the weatherman can now tell us fairly accurately where the hurricane is going to go. Should the president be getting computer modeled forecasts with regards to intelligence? I, I'll take a shot at this, but I want uh, Greg to deal with this one as well, because this is a question we face often. Uh, my personal view on this is I'm, I'm much more of the view that uh, there are all sorts of factors that come into play. And let me give you an example with the Arab Spring. If you thought after what, watching what happened in Cairo was going to be the model, I would then ask you, please explain to me why we saw what happened in Libya, and perhaps more importantly, what's unfolding now in Syria. They didn't exactly stick to the model. This, in turn, gets you into a variety of factors that have to do with the nature of society, the demography, the sectarian divides, the leadership, the mindset of the leaders, 
their past experiences, and perhaps most importantly, their willingness to use force to suppress and kill their own people, which clearly the military who worked for Mr. Bumarak were not prepared to do. I think we're seeing a very different side of things in Syria. So I guess where I'm going is I, I would be a, a bit wary about trying to computerize assessments of how leaders and political elites would respond to large crowds. Greg? In general, it seems to me there is, uh, I mean, uh, Peter's cautions are certainly uh, all well taken. But in general, what strikes me and struck me when I did this work looking uh, around the various agencies is that there's really surprisingly little use of method and technology in most intelligence analysis. The computers get used mostly for search, not much beyond that. So it seems to me there is, uh, particularly now, data that's available, not definitive, but if you're trying to, to see patterns, uncover old patterns, remember old patterns, remember hypotheses you've forgotten. Uh, we get, making much more use of method and computers, I think, is important given, but, but it, doesn't, it doesn't give you the answer. It's just another set, a richer set of tools. There's a whole family of tools for trying to, uh, to put together, so, to aggregate sub subjective judgments in a systematic way that, uh, that may work. Well, recently, a, a look at forecasting across the various il intelligence agencies said that, uh, found that, this is a little bit of character, found that mostly they didn't use methods, and in many cases didn't even know there were methods out there that are useful in forecasting, and the single most prevalent method they found is one we know isn't good, and that is bringing together a group of experts, hammering out a consensus view, you're a lot better off asking them to vote separately and then aggregating the votes. So um, I think we can make much more use of method and technology, granted uh, Peter's reservations about them uh, providing definitive answers. The footnote to that is, uh, and I should have asked, I should have stated this at, at the outset, it depends on what the nature of the question absolutely, is. Absolutely, absolutely. If it's an issue about political decision making, I would stick with my theory. If it's a more technical or model based, a good example might be the huge use of computers that goes into crunching data for people who do terrorism analysis, to be honest, which I won't get into a lot of details, but there's a tremendous amount of data crunching that goes on uh, in terms of the hunt for relationships and patterns and networks right. um, that we would be, it would be hard to do the job without it. We had a question. We're here, okay, and we have a gentleman in the back here, too. If you could raise your hand so someone can get a mic to you in that side of the room. Great. And over I, uh, here. I would like to thank the panel for an absolutely fascinating uh, symposium. I actually have two questions. Uh, the first one is more specifically towards the panel itself. The second one is uh, for Professor Holloway. Uh, the first question, I had the opportunity to have 30 seconds of discussion with Admiral Inman, but I'm hoping that my question will be elaborated upon, and that is there existed a trio, and that trio was President Reagan, John Paul II, the Pope, late Pope, and Edward Teller. And anecdotally and analytically, uh, that trio interacted and plotted and certainly intrigued on certain levels to plan or at least lay out some of the groundwork for the ultimate fall of uh, the Soviet Union. But uh, clearly, John Paul II, because of his very warm relationship with President Reagan, played an absolutely pivotal role Edward Teller may have played a role in convincing President Reagan that SDI was worth pursuing, but John Paul II uh, unarguably provided the catalyst that brought together solidarity in Poland. But if you look at the timing of his visits and the progressive duration of his visits to Poland, uh, it, it looks as though there was a very close collaboration between President Reagan and uh, our late Pope. Now, for Professor Holloway, my question is, um, the Soviet Union showed remarkable foresight 
in anticipating the possibility that the United States would launch a nuclear weapons program. And that goes back to 1939. So their foresight was a very long standing. They had the option of pursuing German or American developments. But uh, earlier this afternoon, um, Mr. Kolligan very modestly uh, referred to the penetration of maybe 13 agents into the Manhattan Project. I say modest because the penetration was probably more widespread than that and certainly existed in the UK. So if Professor Holloway um, for the second question might elaborate on the astonishing prescience uh, shown by the, uh, the KGB or the NKVD or the GPU in, in that uh, assessment. So thank you very much. Anybody uh, want to take the, the question? first question? No, the question. <laughs> okay. Want, take the question first, David. Uh, um, so let me uh, uh, address the, the second question. Yes, if you're looking for uh, an example of a highly successful, maybe one of the most successful intelligence operations in the 20th century on the kind of scientific and technical side, then clearly the, um, the Soviet uh, espionage uh, in the Manhattan Project has to rank very high. Um, we now have uh, a great number of the documents that were uh, passed over to uh, the Soviet Union by Klaus Fuchs, by uh, John Cairncross, by a number of other people, as um, General Kalugin said. And we also have, which is to my mind even more interesting, is the uh, assessments written of the intelligence received by Igor Kurchatov, who was the physicist in charge of the Soviet project. There are some blips in the story. Um, Beria uh, initially thought that this was disinformation, and uh, certainly in the early period, I mean, the, uh, I'll try not to get started on this. I find it an interesting <laughs> story, but so the first information uh, really uh, arrived uh, late in um, 1941. Uh, really significant information. The Russians had done some very good work on nuclear fission before the German invasion, and then that work stopped because of the condition in the country. The question was then when to renew it. It was renewed at the end of 1942, early 43, on a very small basis. You know, could we see whether something would be done? And even by um, uh, August 1945, when the bombs were, were dropped on Hiroshima, it was still essentially a, a lab project. It wasn't a big industrial project of the kind the Manhattan Project was. I mean, the Manhattan Project employed, what, 120,000 people at its peak during the war. And it's really two weeks after Hiroshima, Stalin signs a decree creating a special um, project, a special committee on the atomic bomb headed by Beria, which turns it into a crash program. And there has been, or there was certainly in the 90s, uh, a dispute between the physics community and the intelligence community in, 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 in Russia, where KGB people were saying, oh, our physicists are useful. It was really we who built the bomb. And the physicists saying, no, 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 it was, you know, it was good to get the intelligence, but you really had to be a good physicist to understand how to put it all together. But the first Soviet bomb is a copy of the bomb dropped on, on Nagasaki, the first plutonium bomb. May I address the second uh, question? I think first. The, the first question, second. Uh, I do think um, that uh, John Paul II played an absolutely uh, critical role, and indeed Poland played a critical role uh, in the uh, ending of the Soviet Union. I w recently read the Politburo minutes for a meeting in December 1981, just a few days before martial law was imposed on, uh, in Poland by General Jaruzelski. And there's a very interesting discussion, Andropov, uh, Suslov, I mean, members of the Politburo, and they say, 
Well, we're not sure that he's going to do what we want him to do, namely impose martial law, but we're not going to go in with military force. We're fighting a war in Afghanistan. The Poles will resist. There'll be pressure from the West. And so uh, I, I, I think most people thought, well, if Yaroselsky doesn't act, the Soviet Union will intervene. And many people justify his action in terms of saying, well, if he hadn't acted, the Soviet Union would have sent in forces. But from this Politburo uh, discussion, there's no disagreement. They all say, no, it's impossible for us to go in. Of course, they could have changed their minds, but it's still very revealing that the, um, the movement in uh, Poland, uh, which, gave, which of course got enormous help from the election of the Pope, and therefore I suppose we have to thank the Holy Ghost in the end for uh, what happened, is that um, it, it was uh, extremely important. Thank you, David. Now we had a questioner in the back. Do you have a mic? Great. This is directed for any of the members that would care to tackle it. Uh, for the past 25 years, we've had a national obsession with transparency. Now, that's been fine for uh, legal, legislative, and financial matters. But when it comes to the military and the intelligence services, how do you feel that affects our national security? Greg? We certain, it certainly has a big effect. It's going to be an enormous effect. I, I did some work recently on the use of social networking media by the various intelligence agencies, and it was a nice look at kind of the wave that's going to wash over intelligence. I mean, transparency is going to increase, no doubt about it. You know, already you can be located, you can be searched. Uh, so it, uh, it's going to make lots of traditional ways we've done intelligence a lot harder. Traditional cover is going to become if it hasn't already, it's going to become virtually impossible. Uh, so it's going, to, it's going to have a big effect. I th think the question is, uh, it's making all sorts of places, including some potential adversaries, more transparent. Notice that the autocratic regimes in Arab Spring faced really draconian choices about cutting themselves off from the internet so they could stop communications among would-be protesters. So it's, I think it's hard at this stage to net out the goods and the bads but it's with us. It's with us for sure. It's only going to get worse. And it'll certainly make, uh, have a big Im impact on the way intelligence has traditionally done much of its business. Do you have any other questions in the back? Yes, uh, with the mention of uh, the Arab Spring, about uh, two weeks ago, possibly three in Sugarland, Texas, Pamela Geller was um, scheduled to speak at the Hilton Hotel with pressure from uh, CARE and the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, that was canceled. And as we all know, the Hilton is a very high profile uh, American uh, corporation, mm -hmm. international interest, and I'm wondering just what do you feel the ramifications of that might be? I'm not sure this is an intelligence or policy <laughs> question for any of us to really comment on. If I could add one footnote on a a point that Greg made, because it's, it's one that's very dear to my heart. It's the issue about intelligence uh, warning. And for me, and I think Greg really put his finger on it, it's a matter of timing. If somebody wrote a paper in 1979 that said, and I read Murray Feshbach's work, we actually had a team of analysts who looked at societal issues. And I've always been one who was one of the more dour people who thought these are really, really serious issues. And the data point I would cite is, the birth rate in Russia is actually declining. It's the only modern advanced society where the projections are in the next 30 years, the number of Russians will go from roughly 140 million to in the 110 million range. If you think about the geopolitical and social consequences of that, how do you man your army? How do you get a workforce? Do you import the workforce from Central Asia? And if you think about the ethnic problems the Russians have already with people from the Caucasus, these are huge, huge issues. Mm -hmm. But the issue is, when do you ring the bell? Do you run down to the White House and say, you should see this problem that's coming in 30 years. It's really going to bring the place down. Well, you're probably not going to get a resounding, that's great. Uh, so now, what do I do with that information? And for me, it's really a question of being there at the right time. And, and the thing I liked about Greg's essay, which is definitely worth a read in the book, he lays out the, a, a time sequencing. It's good to do kind of a long-term piece, and you begin to alert people there's a problem. And as you get closer, you say, it's coming closer. Let me tell you the reasons why. 
and how it might play out. And then when you get to that tactical warning, we're here, we're very close, and these are the terrible decisions that the leaders face. And in the case of Gorbachev and the coup plotters, they were going to watch the dissolution of the Soviet happen in front of their eyes with the signing of the new treaty among the former republics into truly independent states. For most of us, that marked the real bell. If they let this happen, it's essentially over. Mm -hmm. And that, in, in our view, was really one of the major triggers for the decision to go ahead with the coup. Greg, you're happy to welcome to comment on this. <laughs> no, I, I, basically, I, I, I couldn't agree more. A warning that's, that's too far out is probably unhelpful. Doesn't get, the question doesn't get asked. The answer doesn't get listened to. But it, it would be, I think the challenge intelligence faces is really to keep trying to push what is inevitably for policymakers very short time horizons. Keep trying to push it out, help them see current decisions in the shadow of the future in some sense. Uh, it's a real challenge because all of us who've had experience on either side of the policy intelligence equation know that you get a piece like that. If you're a policymaker and you say, boy, that really looks interesting, I'm going to read that when I have time, and there's never time. So trying to do that in a form that, that is useful, affects what a policymaker thinks he or she needs to do today, that's the real challenge. And I think it's one that is really sharpened by the kind of shapelessness of the world we're, we're in these days. That in principle, I think, should make for much tighter relations between intelligence and policy as they're in a kind of a joint exploration of what this world looks like and how we advance American interests in it. But that runs into uh, the, the problem of time, as it always does. So with that, uh, do we have any final questions? Speaking of time. Uh, one word. <laughs> We're almost done. Uh, I can assure you, and I think I can speak on behalf of the entire intelligence community, there are many of us who are watching China very closely. Uh, I don't think we have to ring a bell. No, no, we're, we're writing. Well, the intelligence community's function is to provide the information, identify trends, be they good or bad or threatening, but at the end of the day, the policymakers have to be the ones who drive the decision process. We are there not to be recommenders or uh, advocates. We're really there to lay out the information. We have to ask the right questions, and I, I believe we are asking the right questions. The policymakers have to decide how they want to act upon those, those messages. So I think we're getting close to the end. I think I want to hand it over to Duke. Well, I'd like to thank everyone who participated today. I think it was an extraordinary opportunity. I think it's a great day for um, information to be shared. It's great for the National Archives to be able to work with the Central Intel Intelligence Agency to release these documents. And once again, I'd like to give everybody a round of applause. Now, of course, there is a lot of work behind the scenes that goes on, and there's a couple of people that I'd like to thank personally. Uh, first and foremost is my assistant, Carrie Kelly. Where are you, Carrie? And then I see Allie and Andrew and Barbara and uh, Gloria. I think you guys did a great job. We appreciate all your hard work. And now a meeting like this wouldn't be uh, the same without presentation. So I would ask that Jeannie Teisinger, Oleg Kalugin, and Peter Clement come up here for uh, a special award or presentation. If you could stand.
As you might know, this is the 100th anniversary year of the birth of Ronald Reagan. And in doing so, the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation has done an extraordinary job of events throughout the United States and, quite frankly, throughout the world. Um, and freedom is one of those common things, those common themes that you have. But the love and admiration of President Reagan far beyond the borders of the United States. And in commemoration, we had a project, the foundation had a project where they had a coin toss at um, the NFL games and college football games and high school football games. And a coin was struck, a silver coin. And I'd like to present each one of these fine people up here with the official centennial coin. Oh, well. Thank you. And then I think I'm going to ask Joe to come on up here because we have one final presentation, or maybe two. Did you get it? Yeah, got it. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. To thank the library, we have a plaque that uh, has four uh, quadrants on it, and uh, it has a couple of coins. And I'll just read the bottom left one. And it's a quote from Ronald Reagan, and it says, Information is the oxygen of the modern age. It seeps through the walls, topped by barbed wire. It waves from across the electric borders. The Goliath of totalitarianism will be brought down by the David of the microchip. So, Duke, thank you very much for your partnership. There's one for the CIA as well. Well, actually, I, what I'd like to do is invite uh, Joe and Peter Nyron. Peter, are you out here? Jennifer Crow and Bruce Barkin to come on up. These four people did an outstanding job. And it was actually, um, Nick, it's been three years since we've been working on this. And it's an extraordinary process. And I can't stress enough the importance of these individuals and the work that they do on a daily basis because it was the information like this that President Reagan was able to do these great things. So on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. And with that, the evening is concluded. Thank you.